Uh, this is our fourth of these calls this week. We uh, did two yesterday and then one about an hour ago. And uh, it's been a fascinating, uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, so really delighted you're all here. Thanks, thanks for joining us uh, for a little bit this afternoon. Doug, you want to go ahead and uh, advance the slide? Doug's going to drive the slide deck. Hey, uh, Steve, as you jump in there, let me just, because a lot of folks are familiar with you and I, but not so much, uh, had a chance to meet Carl. Uh, just introduce quickly, this is Carl Sanders Edwards. Uh, Carl is the uh, CEO and founder of Adeption, uh, which is a uh, vertical development technology platform. <laughs> uh, probably the only one that we know of in the world, at least that's the claim we're going to make Carl and stick with it until <laughs> someone proves us wrong, and has about as much experience as anyone we know in working in a virtual environment uh, as his business, as what they do. And uh, he'll also tell you that uh, as much as he works in that environment, he's learning as much now as he was the first time he started it. And uh, so we invited Carl to join us just as a way of recognition there. We started working with Carl about a year ago now, a little over a year, and we now are actively engaged in moving a significant portion of our content and our work and uh, strategically working together over onto Carl's platform. And uh, that's been a labor of love for us now for a number of months and it's gone prime and live. So uh, this is very a time, really a timely uh, chance for us to uh, have Carl join us. So welcome, Carl. Hello everyone and thanks for that, Bill. Um, and you may, ex you may notice a bit of an accent here, so I'll just ask you all to work with that. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm currently sitting in, in Marin in the Bay Area. Uh, but the longer that I live in the US, the stronger my New Zealand accent gets. <laughs> and if anyone calls it Australian, I'm out for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't ever happen, does it, Carl? <laughs> <laughs> Every day, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Carl. So just to start out, we're going to do a little framing around uh, stuff most of you are familiar with in terms of how we hold sort of the context for 21st century leadership. Um, walk you through some of our own learnings around kind of leadership of, of self and leadership of others in these VUCA-like conditions we're in over the last uh, few weeks, and uh, talk a little bit about the creative competencies that we're finding most uh, useful and helpful uh, in these kinds of times. After that, we're kind of gonna pivot to a couple of case, three case examples uh, with clients that we've been working with, uh, where we've pivoted and shifted to a more virtual, um, uh, design and delivery and uh, kind of lessons learned from there and uh, also would love to hear your own lessons learned uh, for those of you who've uh, been working in virtual environments for the last few years. But let me start here. I mean, the, the framing we use typically for context for leadership is VUCA, this idea of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's fascinating just to look at uh, you know, this model through sort of the lens of the last uh, 10 weeks as the COVID-19 virus has really hit worldwide. Uh, it really came out of nowhere and uh, is kind of un of unknown duration and intensity. Uh, every day seems to bring uh, a, a new challenge. Uh, I was talking to somebody in Hong Kong yesterday and they were saying that part of what's being communicated there is you know, it's likely it may abate a little bit over the summer, but it's probably going to come back in the fall for another round. Uh, and that will probably still be, uh, you know, uh, pre-vaccine time. So this thing is, is, uh, is got a long tail on it. Um, we've been talking to leaders virtually every day, um, sometimes hour to hour, as they struggle with uh, making business decisions given the environmental uh, impact this is having uh, on supply chain, on markets, uh, on travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So incomplete information, really unpredictable, tough to map, uh, highly interdependent kinds of challenges that are surfacing. Uh, I was listening to a story coming into the office today about, uh, you know, a lot of college campuses are, cha are closing down. And they've got a lot of vulnerable uh, populations in terms of students who actually can't go home. And, uh, you know, but with dorms closing and food services closing, clothing, uh, you know, there's food insecurity there for those students stuck on campus. 
So it's got all kinds of interesting uh, challenges. Um, the other thing we're finding with our leaders is the challenge around how do I make the right decision? Uh, their decision confidence is, is really at risk here and, and compromised given the ambiguity of the information, uh, the multiple threads of information. And uh, I think Bill was on a call early this morning around uh, with a leader uh, trying to sort that out for themselves and their business. So we frame this, Doug, if you'll go one more slide. We frame this in terms of its uh, connection to kind of adult development and the complexifying of the self, kind of with this graphic, this idea that you could chart any organizational system on some continuum of VUCA-like conditions, and most leaders in these, in these days, in this century, are dealing with fairly high VUCA conditions, um, and that puts a demand on the complexity of the self, that puts a demand on our meaning-making systems. Uh, and our capacity to take perspective on the self and surround. And for a lot of us, our you know current leadership consciousness threshold is is underneath that demand. It, it uh, or as Robert Keegan would say, we're in over our heads developmentally, and that's that developmental gap. I think we're all experiencing pretty acutely right now. Um, some of it right now is as simple as I don't know how to work virtually, <laughs> uh, and uh, and some of it's a little more got a little more depth to it in terms of, uh, I don't want to handle, handle, personally handle the own complexity, my own complexity, uh, given what's happening maybe in, even just in my family system. So, go one more, Doug. We pulled this uh, slide from the John Hopkins uh, site yesterday morning uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, the total confirmed cases around the world was 121,000. I haven't looked at it today, but I'm sure that's gone up probably five or 10,000 by now. Uh, but it's just a really interesting, uh, you know, snapshot dashboard of uh, the spreading VUCA conditions of one particular instance uh, of a VUCA-like uh, occurrence. So it raises these primary questions, at least for us, is you know, how do we move more consciously from this reactive state of anxiety driven by these circumstances to more of a conscious creative stance of uh, creating outcomes that really do matter? Uh, how do we build kind of durable leadership competencies that both increase and propagate effectiveness in the VUCA world? I've, I've really been thinking a lot about in the last week or two about this idea of how do we actually get more conscious about pro propagating effectiveness. How do we spread it more quickly uh, at depth around the world? And part of the reason for these calls this week is, is in an effort to, to mobilize our own network here in that regard. Uh, and then finally, what, what are we learning about sort of the creative dimensions that can really help us, uh, particularly in the example we're facing right now? What are we learning over the last few weeks around uh, leaning into some of those competencies really deliberately. So I want to talk a little bit about leadership of self and leadership of others. Um, from a leadership of self perspective, probably front and center is how we manage our own contraction and anxiety given the onslaught of, of news every day around the coronavirus. How are we uh, handling and, and our own uh, piece of that? Second piece is how, how can we pivot? And I think, I bet if we took a quick poll here, almost all of you have probably experienced clients coming to you and saying, hey, I, I need, we need to cancel this meeting. We're gonna postpone it. Uh, and you're seeing things disappear off your calendar. One way to experience that obviously is as threat. It's threat to your business development, your livelihood, your income, your revenue. Uh, how can, you, how can you shift that perspective and begin to see that opening space in, in maybe your calendar, your portfolio, uh, as more opportunity, uh, as a, a time maybe to, uh, to innovate? One of the things we're finding in those conversations with clients is they may be making a um, kind of a gut level, uh, non-reflective, we need to cancel this kind of decision when there's actually an awful lot of possibilities available to continue on, but to continue on virtually. 
And so, so holding that space as an opportunity to have maybe a different conversation with your client or with yourself. Um, the idea here that we're, we're in a certain set of circumstances, what's the emergent development that possibilities that are coming out of this set of circumstances? So what's, what's here for me developmentally? What can I lean into developmentally that is going to be useful? I can't tell you how the number of, uh, let's stay on that former one, Doug. I can't tell you the number of clients I've had over the years that when times have gotten tough, uh, you know, business headwinds have hit them hard uh, and it's gotten challenging. They've abandoned their kind of practices they've built for themselves in terms of taking care of themselves. You know, they've stopped running or they've stopped working out or they've stopped meditating or they've stopped uh, spending time with their their kids every Sunday, whatever the case may be, they, they abandon those practices that have actually been really fundamental to staying centered and grounded and in their larger self. So what we're trying to practice in our organization and trying to talk to with, about, with our clients is how do you actually double down on those self-care practices when, when it gets challenging right now? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you flip that script a little bit to be more available to others uh, by taking care of yourself? And then finally, uh, and Bill, I'd love to have you talk a little bit about this one, this idea of how do you, you know, what's, what's required now in terms of your own awareness scan? Um, you were talking yeah. about this on the earlier call, Bill. Yeah, it's a fascinating one for me um, right now as uh, I'm in the practice of my own practice, which is both as a leader as well as a resource to uh, our consult, our clients. And um, my uh, need for an awareness scan uh, to really understand where I am and how that's going has increased um, in a number by uh, six, seven, eight fold. In other words, I'm having to do it literally um, on a regular routine basis. And the one that struck me was that I was doing really well with my clients yesterday and the day before, as well as our own organization, pretty well in my own perspective. And um, I got on a call last night with a family meeting. And the family meeting was uh, my four uh, adult children and their spouses in this case. and. Uh, we have 11 grandchildren. We didn't include all of them on the family meeting last night, given the topic of how we're pulling together and what we can do to be there for each other, et cetera. And I realized that uh, at one point, uh, my own anxiety in that setting was uh, actually more uh, prompting their anxiousness as opposed to helping us get our arms around it. And the scan that I had to take on that awareness in time was when I didn't even realize I needed or had to have. Same thing happened to me this morning with a client. They just needed to be grounded in a decision they were making. It was actually a personal decision. Um, and uh, the personal decision, even though it's a leader of uh, organization, um, was one that uh, took us a moment for me uh, to help them be grounded in uh, with an awareness scan of how are they doing right now? How are they approaching this? Uh, what would be the way that would be most uh, uh, helpful for them. And so this is an ongoing practice of what it means to lead self, not just obviously in the environment we're operating in today, which by the way, was not really even uh, on our screen for many of us until um, maybe in the last few days, and in some cases, last few weeks, and for those that have really been paying attention, maybe since December. So the awareness scan is huge in here for self and others. Thanks, Bill. Another thing we'd like to talk a little bit about is this idea of leadership of others. Uh, what we're finding more and more is helpful with, with our own organization, but also with our clients is really getting more and more conscious and deliberate about coming back to purpose and outcome. What are we here to do? Uh, what's our mission here? Despite all of the, the noise, despite the distraction, uh, and despite all the, the constraints and the challenges, coming back to purpose uh, is, uh, Kind of a, it's, it's the cliche of the North Star, but it's it's really uh, really been useful to cut through all the noise and uh, and ground ourselves. It's also opened up the door for 
what you might think of as the flexible how, you know, you've got, we've got clients coming to us wanting to cancel or postpone or change. Um, and just embracing that, let's just center up on what outcome are we trying to create? If we're building a leadership development program or we've got a global meeting that we need to do virtually, let's, let's get super creative about how do we co-create that with you uh, flexibly. Uh, there's lots of options and, uh, and it's been actually a really fun and, and uh, energizing process to get into design mode uh, anchored to the outcome we're trying to create and just being very flexible about how we're going to do it. There's also just a very practical uh, consideration in here, uh, Steve, that we've been experiencing, which is uh, we've eliminated the language of cancel and uh, moved it to uh, repurpose and or postpone. Mm -hmm. So what does it actually mean in the flexible how is that, uh, well, you know, what we had this scheduled uh, or we we're about ready to do this. Um, what can we do to repurpose it? Obviously, the virtual environment um, is alive and well for us there and or uh, postpone and it's changing the game for us in that flexible how. So it's requiring it of us as practitioners in the same way we're suggesting it to our clients and opening up a game that we wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, it's great. So obviously the, the uh, primary containment strategy for Corona is this idea of social distancing, uh, you know, closing borders and restricting travel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we're experimenting with is how do I, even in the midst of that physical social distancing, how do we increase our emotional proximity to one another and to our clients? Again, using, using all the virtual platforms available. Uh, how do we increase both the frequency and the depth of those conversations? Um, people are anxious, people are hurting, people are worried, um, and people are scrambling. So how do we, how do we be there with them uh, in lots of different ways? And just getting super conscious about that possibility. To me, this, this idea of, I mean, I think intimate, intimacy has always been a huge differentiator in the kind of work that we do and the depth that we can hold and, and be in with our clients. Uh, this is just another example of that, of uh, being emotionally proximate in lots of different ways to our, our employees and our clients and our, uh, our families. You know, Steve, if I can add there for a brief moment, um, part of this emotional proximity increasing uh, that is for me also listening to my inner voice yeah. as a leader and as a consultant. So another experience is that, you know, that inner voice that plays out for all of us. Um, and sometimes we discount it pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> I love the uh, Mel Robbins count to five uh, and don't count, discount that inner voice when it's actually coming up because I find that I have to actually change it to count to three because I do it a little quicker. Uh, I don't take a whole five seconds. I discount myself a lot quicker than that. I had it happen um, two days ago. The inner voice said, uh, get a hold of so-and-so. And uh, then very quickly, uh, I discounted it. The discount was uh, he's on vacation with his spouse, his partner. Uh, his family's about to join him. I would never bother this person on vacation. Wait a minute, inner voice said, get a hold of him. I texted him. And immediately after, uh, 15 seconds later, said, oh man, uh, would you mind taking 15 minutes? And we spent the next 15 minutes, maybe 20, uh, really going through a conversation that was uh, incredibly meaningful. And I was grateful in that increasing there of that uh, proximity, uh, even over the uh, cell phone, um, that I listened to that inner voice. That inner voice is a, a big play for us right now and paying attention to it, whatever that means for you and for us and for leaders is uh, really, really important. So this idea of listening in, to probably more depth and being emotionally proximate is, is kind of in service of this idea of how do we mobilize our networks in, in service of, of those in need. I mean, we've got 6,000 or so global practitioners in the LCP. Uh, part of the reason for these four calls this week is to begin to mobilize those networks uh, in, in the service of all of our clients and our families and, and each other, uh, and just being deliberate and conscious about, about doing that. Again, through virtual platform. Um, and then 
what's emerging for us is this idea of team practices. Uh, how are we evolving qu very quickly in some regards, uh, our team practices? And uh, maybe Carl and Bill, you can chat a bit about what we're discovering there. Share yours, Carl, quickly. I'll, I'll back out on this one, but I love what we <clears throat> talked about earlier today. Yeah, I mean, I, the one thing that's relevant here is in our organization, we've been operating in a very distributed virtual manner anyway, from kind of by design from the ground up with, with people across a number of states here in North America, down in New Zealand and in India. And so we've had to really innovate around these sustainable team practices. And it's interesting when you come from a background of facilitation leadership development, you really, uh, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, you really value that intimacy. And so we've all struggled with how do we recreate this? And just a couple that are, um, of things that that work very well is, is a daily is a daily check and it's asynchronous, everyone in their own time on a WhatsApp group. And it's remarkable how that simple act can close um, across continents and oceans, the sense of intimacy and bring it right in. You know what other people are working on, you know what they're struggling with. The next minute photos of family are being sent around and shared as well. And it just really increases the sense of we're in this together and we're working on the same thing with each other um, and I see uh, I see Mark also on this call from our team and he's he's constantly been talking to me about a global get-together where everyone can physically be together and because of constraints of time and money we haven't been able to do that but you know you can run small groups in their current locations have activities create a video take some photos and then we all get together as a global team for 30 30 60 minutes online and share that and share those cross 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 examples, um, and it's just so important. And it's the interesting thing is you can do it. And what I'm excited is the wrong the wrong word to use, but what I'm hopeful of um, is that what I just shared then is kind of being gradually learned over the last three or four years. Um, I think that's going to be surpassed within the next two weeks right. across the network, just absolutely within this call right now. Like you're all doing things, you're being forced to do things that is going to create an explosion of innovation and an explosion of ways that we can operate effectively, really effectively um, in, a, in a more constrained environment. And that's going to enable back up to the centering on purpose and outcome, the ability to spread the type of work that we do and um, back to Steve's, uh, that developmental gap, that's, that's alive and kicking. That was there before the coronavirus. Um, and there were a vast lot of people who weren't getting access to the sort of work that you all do. Um, and we're going to be able to collectively, as a system, as an industry, as a group, learn very rapidly now how to get that to a lot more people. Um, and I think that's important. And it's important to remember that in this, there's an opportunity, just not for ourselves and our own, our own businesses, but more really of the bigger things that we're in service of. And that's motivating to teams, that's motivating to people, and it's, um, it's showing a lot of care. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. And one of the things that is hitting me pretty hard is that, that I'm really conscious of this particular, you know, pandemic that we're in now is just the first of multiple waves this century we're going to face in terms of VUCA challenges, uh, massive amounts of displaced people, climate stuff, you know, extreme weather. There's going to be different local impacts all over the world, probably in any given week. Uh, so the urgency around getting really good and effective at leading in this kind of, in these kinds of conditions uh, is is really front and center for a lot of us right now so and Steve you play out these leadership of others the five bullets that uh, we've been practicing and playing with here in the last number of weeks uh, sometimes that building uh, a team practice a sustaining team practice maybe to sustain it for a week in the current world yeah. So uh, call doing a check-in with the leader, um, left Israel, uh, Tel Aviv last Wednesday, flew to Madrid. Um, now we're sitting on Thursday of this week, um, Wednesday night, uh, getting ready to go back on Friday morning. Uh, was told he couldn't come back to Israel. So he's locked out. He's still in Madrid. And he's the CEO they had to build a new team practice literally overnight, not figuratively, literally overnight. And now that team practice is sustained going into a second week. 
And then on top of that, he did the same thing with his family because they're in Tel Aviv and he's in Madrid. So, you know, you start to think about what it means to be in a world that's being driven as it is in a fairly extreme way right now by what's happening around us and staying grounded and all that. Part of that is, is what are some of the go-to things I can do and structure in and of itself we know it determines performance, but structure is also a settling factor, just like the increasing of emotional proximity or the grounding and the anchoring. Structure gives us some grounding and settling that we would not have otherwise, and a team practice is a structure. Yeah, fantastic. So final thing here uh, on the next slide, Doug, uh, is what are we learning in terms of being really conscious about uh, leveraging particular creative competencies ones that have really surfaced for us are caring connection, this whole, this whole idea of being emotionally proximate with more frequency and really tuning into what are people's experience right now in the midst of all this and, and how, do I, how do I be there with them in whatever they need? Um, and again, leveraging that virtually. Um, the personal learner piece, and that goes everywhere, every kind of the whole span of continuum of some really pragmatic, practical skill building around, yeah, I really don't know how to, you know, be a consultant or a coach virtually. I've got this huge, you know, hill to climb in terms of technology and uh, all the way to the deeper questions of, of, of what does this mean to me right now, this idea of emergent development, you know, what, how is all of this hitting me and, and what can I take from it from a developmental perspective? The other one is collaborator or co-creation. We're doing so much on the fly, immediate co-creation work with each other and with our clients on a day-to-day -day basis that it's, uh, and it's, it's fun, it's energizing, it's exciting, it's creative. Uh, it's back to that flexible how piece, uh, but there's a ton of creation work going on right now uh, that as Carl mentioned is quite innovative. And I think what we're gonna see in, in the next couple of weeks is is going to far surpass what we've seen probably in the last few years. And then finally, community concern, which we've been talking about, mobilizing networks really consciously uh, uh, to serve our mission. And then obviously the purposeful and visionary piece. These are the ones that are really active for us right now uh, as being important and, and kind of mission centric, if you will. So I want to stop there and just kind of maybe, Doug, you can turn the slides off again and, and just ask for insights or observations or questions from, from all of you. Uh, what are you learning? Uh, what's, what's landing for you? And uh, let's get into that conversation a little bit. Uh, it's just a thought. This is Mark here from New Zealand. Um, relates to giving current clients confidence as we repurpose their sessions, particularly if they've not used virtual formats previously. We've got a, a client here that does air traffic control. So the operational people um, are critical involved in the trainings and they were about to cancel the trainings for next week. We managed to repurpose them as an opportunity to pilot virtual. Uh, ironically, it was a real conversations program. So they wanted it to happen in person. And I said, well, how about we, uh, enable them to have real conversations virtually, see the power of it so they can stay more connected as a multiple set of offices in different spaces around New Zealand. Um, and if it doesn't work, we can do face-to-face -face again later. And if it's too hard, we can always reschedule. But are you up for it? And uh, they said maybe and explored it and the technology and if they could. Um, and I think the confidence of me talking about current clients that were doing it already and saying, hey, why don't you speak to Lucy at Fonterra or such and such at this organization to find out that the virtual sessions are actually having a higher resonant frequency and higher feedback than the face-to-face, -face, just to give them that confidence and nudge to move them towards it. Uh, and then I got a text yesterday morning to say, yep, we're going ahead with it, let's run the pilot. So. Um, helping them to have confidence in decisions and the value of the opportunity that's there um, by connecting them to people that are doing it already. That's fantastic. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. Others? I'll just add this is really timely because I literally just sent an email to a client this morning. We have a two-day team kickoff on April 1st and 2nd and 
they're like all full steam ahead and I in my head I'm going this is never gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> and so I sent him a note I'm like here are your options we can go ahead we can reschedule just like what Mark said, or we could do it virtually. And here's what that would look like. And we can perfect co create it. And, um, and my colleague who's co facilitating with me is clearly uncomfortable with the virtual option. And <laughs> I said, look, it's not ideal, but it's better than, you know, delaying. And this is a team Mark like yours that needs to learn how to work virtually and is so against it. I'm like, this is the way to get them in there. <laughs> get them with it and play with whiteboards and flip charting and, you know, doing all sorts of things you can do that they don't even know about right now. <laughs> I love that. Jules, you, Jules, you've done a ton of virtual work, so. I have, I have. I actually, though, you guys just helped me think, like sometimes you get in your own box about how a meeting has to be. So mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm like, okay, so it's two days and here's the agenda. So we'll just do that virtually. And as I'm sitting here, I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way. It could be over three days, shorter chunks, yep. change some of the acts. Some of them adapt really well, but some of them are going to be a stretch. So being really creative. And so I thank you all for that. <laughs> and it's, um, and sorry to I love adaption. I just want to say it. I couldn't help but dive in with the, um, I was talking yesterday, ironically, at a face-to-face -face workshop about the upside of the acceleration in flexible working and trust and empowerment for employees of entire offices shutting down and sending their people home and then realizing they'll be as if not more productive at home, which they could have realized years ago, but just haven't tapped into. And so I'm really excited about the opportunity that this creates both for virtual workshops and leading in this space, but also for organizations to remove significant costs out of their organization and build the trust and empower the people to do what they can do so that you don't have to spend two hours in traffic on the road, which I do regularly and I, I like not to. <laughs> this is Teresa. I am, um, I'm personally excited about co-creating with clients in terms of how to do things virtually. I'm coaching, I have a gentleman at physicians at hospitals and I've been uh, reorganizing the meetings to be virtual um, in those cases, especially over the next week. Um, so I think it's exciting from a structure standpoint and getting co-creating. Um, the intimacy part is interesting because I think over time it's so key in terms of um, building intimacy, whether it's the family or the clients and everyone. I already get a sense that people are feeling a little bit more isolated as well as the elevated angst uh, that people have around how they might be exposed or loved ones exposed. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in di diving deeper into that. And I actually have a class coming up with the leadership circle and was so excited to do some mat exercises. So if anyone wants to co-create some virtual ideas around that, um, let me know if that's oh, coming up. I just got finished creating a virtual mat with uh, <laughs> the ability to do it online and we're just practicing so it's just a little matter of time now to have it nailed because uh, we may not be doing as much on the mat uh, face to face as we were so Doug you actually got that handled this last week and we practicing it for the first time yep so, it's amazing what you can get done in a day or two when you have to <laughs> yeah if you've got any early tips in the next two weeks and are able to share I'd I love it yeah connect with Doug yeah, reach out. Uh, we should know more even in the next day or two. So yeah, we actually are, our delivery is uh, Monday, so we're <laughs> we're in that now. <laughs> and if I can help you, I'm happy to as well. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, this is uh, Tim from Seattle. Hi, Tim. Uh, in, the, Hi, Tim. in the heart of uh, in the heart of a lot of uh, interesting energy around. Um, yeah, I'm a I'm a somatic coach, so doing things virtually is is really fascinating to do over the phone. Um, pretty pretty powerful. Um, I'm a recent uh, Amazon uh, employee, so all of those 53,000 people here in Seattle are now uh, 800,000 that are all going to be working from home. It's really fascinating. Um, unfortunately for me, my partner works from home and communicates to all of those 800,000 employees all day long. So it's a 20 hour <laughs> a day at home. Um, so I'm really appreciative of this um, information. So I have a question in my inner, my inner voice is coming up and I have a, um, a session with the CEO of a startup here tomorrow. 
Um, so I graduated from LCP um, in December. So this is my uh, second client that I have. And we just kicked off their surveys on Monday. And I have a feeling that now everybody is working from home. Schools are closed. And so my, the CEO has six kids and she's like, oh my God, like I've got, you know, I've got to figure out how to take care of my kids and I've got this stuff. And I'm, I'm anticipating the question will come up. Should we wait to get the feedback for the survey? until after this or is it uh, or should we move forward since people are kind of in a uh, their own kind of shape right now somatically yeah you know it's interesting tim um especially with those uh <laughs> dynamics and uh, what you mentioned there my uh my uh primary go-to on that and i think i've dealt with it about half a dozen times now in the last uh, two weeks as uh, recently as yesterday with the hospital system and uh, what I'm saying is uh, leaning into the creating of space. I know that there's also filling of that space, six kids being at home, no schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and while there's not even, there's never been a better time than right now to actually take that moment to give that feedback and do it in that forum and uh, to actually lean into that in a way. Um, and I'm, ad I'm advising my clients to not pull back. I'm advising them to lean in. So what does it mean to actually lean in in this environment uh, and be able to actually accelerate or accomplish more than we would otherwise and still be able to fulfill upon all those things that you just mentioned? And the mix, I love uh, the rich mix. Uh, I was on yesterday with a client and uh, popped up from San Francisco. We're on a Google line. Um, oh, by the way, happened to be a Googler. And... Uh, he said, is this the best or what? And I went, is this the best or what, what? And he said, I'm working from home. <laughs> I've been trying to do this forever. And now I'm trying to figure out how it is that I can get everybody else to feel the same way about it, even though it might end very quickly. And so I sit here thinking, well, there's something. Uh, I wouldn't have hit that one. And then we uh, laid out what it is we've got to do to coach a group of people that we were doing peer-to-peer -peer coaching face-to-face, -face, containing intimacy because we're in the same space together. He just opened it for me. He was like, wow, oh yeah, we can do that. We can repurpose this one. So that's the way I've been playing with it. Great. Thank you. I wanna get us uh, kind of moving towards the uh, client examples because that'll drive some more conversation. Uh, so Doug, if you can put the deck back up and uh, Carl maybe give us- in, everybody. Little context here. Um. Yeah, just just as we do this, um, I'd love to tap into, and this is the maybe I'm being slightly selfish about that innovation um, innovation uh, driver, but I've got a sense there's an awful lot of knowledge um, on this call right now, and some things that people are doing. And if we could have a chance to connect some of that up very very quickly, I'd just love to invite you um, before we start talking about these case studies to take one minute and type in anything that you have done in your own practices, like what Mark shared, um, like we've heard that um, you think could be of benefit to everyone else on this call. So just any nuggets of information, any nuggets of knowledge, any things that you've, that you've done or that you've seen done, or even that you're considering doing mm -hmm. as far as um, making more of uh, our practice and, and work virtual and able to work <coughs> in this remote environment. I'd just love to see to see what we bring up just through just using the chat functionality. Thank you, Teresa. Oh, some great podcasts from those two, aren't they? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. 
So we'll we'll keep moving through these um, through these case studies. But please, as anything springs to mind, um, I'd love to see forty or fifty of these, and, and, and we're we're rapidly building them right now. Um, and we'll make them available post this call to everyone, um, just as a as a pool of best practice, and we can see how quickly these things can connect up and inspire each other to do more. So the first case, case example, uh, we have a global pharma client um, and uh, they, had a, they had a redesign meeting they had, had on the books. It was a day and a half design uh, to really redesign uh, the global top team. Uh, they had to pivot to completely virtual because of travel restrictions. Um, so they quickly centered up on kind of aspiration, focus on business areas and structure and they used a agile sprint methodology, but they did it entirely uh, uh, virtually in that same one and a half day kind of chunk. Uh, some of their learnings were they used three different te technology platforms all for different uses. They used Google Hangouts for the plenary all group sessions. They used uh, Jamboards for their small group breakouts and they used WhatsApp for kind of the ongoing communication between all of them uh, throughout. From a design perspective, they mixed up the work formats um, and took longer breaks. Uh, so there were, you know, fairly discrete sections of when they were all together and then they would break out in groups of three or four. Uh, one of their learnings was that the virtual meeting really is less flexible. They had to have more upfront design and prep, uh, more structure in a sense, and stricter time boxing. You know, everybody needs to be back on the call at X time. You can't manage that uh, virtually the same way you can manage it, obviously, in the room together. Uh, their other uh, learnings were around kind of managing energy and uh, bringing a lot of sort of energizers and playfulness into uh, the whole one and a half days. I mean, they did simple things like, uh, you know, send on WhatsApp a picture out your window wherever you are right now. And then they took a little time just laughing and having some fun about that. They did another one later. Uh, with take a picture of the drink that's in your hand right now because they were in all different time zones around the world. So some folks had coffee, some had wine, some had a beer, uh, just as a way to be connected and uh, having some fun with each other. Their primary learning, I think, was around uh, the, the, the necessity and importance of a, a real good emotional connection and relationship. The content was the content, but if they could, uh, they could be as a team, the, the group of 16, in a really uh, deliberate, conscious, connected, emotionally proximate way uh, to do the work, that that made all the difference. Second one, uh, Bill, I think is you. Yeah, well, uh, I love the one you just shared, Steve, because what it didn't share is that was all redesigned you know, in about four days and uh, delivered uh, Monday and Tuesday. <laughs> yep. So uh, that wasn't like a not recent example. This one, on the other hand, and you just go forward there, Doug. Um, this one is, uh, I guess, uh, Doug, seven, eight years old now, uh, something like that. Uh, yes, we've sir. Been doing, yeah, we've been doing virtual with this uh, auto company for a lot of years now. And we've designed a virtual uh, set of cohorts over a year period of time. And all of that's been built around what is necessary or in their strategy and is business relevant. And um, just the learnings in there for us, and you can kind of play your way through them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's some real practical ones here. Doug was my co-pilot on all of this, and we had some great learnings, didn't we, Doug? Like, uh, oh, wait a minute, how come that video won't play? Uh, yeah, the first first two years, we learned a lot. <laughs> we learned a lot. And the great part about this, and the reason I bring that up without going into all of those uh, individually, is that um, we helped this group understand that we were learning in a virtual environment together. And what did it mean to extend grace to each other in that environment? Not just for those of us responsible for design and presentation, but those of us that were responsible for participating full out. So I'll give you one example. Uh, maybe uh, three cohorts in um, to the first or second one, 
we actually said, hey, listen, everybody's got to be on camera. We literally defeat the entire purpose of being virtual if you hide behind no camera. I get some people don't like it. In fact, my partner, Steve, it took us a few years, right, Steve? <laughs> Steve showed up off camera for quite a while. He loves camera now, I think. I'm probably exaggerating that. But that was a learning. The other major learning in there and the grace associated with that, which is uh, we can't have five or six people unless we have the right technology in one room and singles all across in every other room. We actually need everybody to be on their own screen with their own camera, and it will significantly make a difference, and it does. So those nuanced pieces, including the learning together, and uh, then you add to it, all of a sudden, if you see it taking, they're actually starting to work together virtually more and better than they ever did previously. So there is a really, really nicely embedded design in there. Last one I'll share with you is that, uh, I hate to say this, <laughs> but I will. We cut the content and the time by half and got better results. <laughs> oh, we don't need four hours for that. We can do it more effectively in 90 minutes. That's hardcore for an old uh, war horse on this for me. It's like, yeah, you gotta lay the foundation of context here. Oh, guess what? That's not what I'm after. What I'm after is having the impact and uh, how I can get more done and be more effective in 90 minutes and hold attention and be focused than I can in three hours. That was a big learning. So those are the ones that came through that. So Steve, there's probably more of it. That's enough because I want to give Carl time. Yeah. Right. No, so thanks. So this this little example's live and playing at the moment. Um, it's a, it's a, I'm living here in North America at the moment, but it is a New Zealand client that is uh, food production based and has a very global um, footprint. So uh, a local team, la la relatively large local team, but then a lot of people around the world. And um, this first started similar to similar to Bill, because of that globally distributed team, we had the challenge of, hey, can we can you deliver cohorts um, front line, so large numbers of people, cohorts uh, across the globe, China, US, South America, um, Australia, and Europe, and. Um, so we 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 designed a bunch of a, a bunch of experiments with that and ran some and uh, and they're still running and the, the latest wave has just started and it started before this current crisis mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about this as a case study is that we've got local groups that are blended technology so we have um, what we call a dumbbell a face-to-face -face session then some digital virtual connection and then another face-to-face those face-to-face -face cohorts are running simultaneously with global cohorts where it's the same design except the face-to-face -face is delivered virtually like this. Um, exactly the same design. A one-day session is actually a series of, of 90-minute sessions. And the, um, the third bullet point is really the aha, is that we were learning before this crisis came out that from a effectiveness, both impact and participant satisfaction point of view, the virtual um, face with the virtual was beating the face to face um, and uh, one of the key reasons really for that is that uh, it forces better practice in your facilitation we've got very very good designers and facilitators running this but there's less chance there's less places to hide with virtual delivery as it was mentioned earlier preparation is more important you have to manage those variables more carefully but when you do you can you can make gr good practice great you can do things to get input from everyone, not just the extroverts. And you really equalize a group and create different spaces for everyone. A couple of the real highlights that I just wanted to pull out um, is flipping the sessions. So to, to Bill's point about content, we were proud of how much interactivity we had and we thought we were, we were great at that. When we took a good, long, hard look at the designs and the amount of time that people were spending together, we said anything that is one-way communication comes out and is asynchronous. That's got no place in a 90-minute session. And wow, did a lot come out. Um, and the good thing is you can deliver that asynchronously. You can create a web video very easily. Um, we made them interactive, so you paused every five minutes and asked people questions, they type in their answers, and it was the basis of what is now the adoption platform. And that asynchronous combined with synchronous sessions really, really improves the experience. It works so well, we do that with every face-to-face -face session now anyway. 
using the same asynchronous methodologies. Um, I mentioned there about we have purpose-built software for this um, that we've been working on for a number of years to do things because you can share insights across cohorts mm -hmm. digitally. So all of a sudden you open up possibilities that don't exist face-to-face. -face. These conversations in a face-to-face -face environment stay within that group. And you as a facilitator maybe tell a story from one group to another. When you, when you embrace digital delivery and virtual delivery, it's, it transitions seamlessly between groups and groups can benefit from groups. And you really start building a wider sense of community. So the purpose-built technologies help with that. However, just like to share a couple that aren't purpose-built and I'm sure there's a lot more in the link um, from Jen, so thank you. But one is loom.com. Somebody may want to type this in. My accent can be tricky. But if you want to flip a classroom or flip an experience and very quickly create a, a, a very quickly create a, a nice video of you setting that framing in context that Bill mentioned, Loom is a fantastic tool. Um, there's another one that we've used extensively, not so much now because we've kind of got our own version of it, but again, for you to quickly lift up is stormboard.com. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do with a post-it note in a room, um, you can do online. And it's quite magical watching it happen, voting, affinity grouping, getting people to share their ideas. Um, so those things allow you to tap into this wisdom of the crowd. So one thing that we've found is it's really more important than ever to prompt and get people to individually think. It's, too, it's very easy to just be a silent participant in a virtual session um, and, and actually contribute nothing. It's equally just as easy to get everyone contributing because you can see it. And if they haven't contributed, call them out. And all of a sudden, you've got a lot more benefit from everyone rather than just the 50% of the room that normally talk, um, which, which relates to the visibility being harder to hide. Um, one lovely little technique which we've used and found super useful is in a plenary session, um, uh, it's, it's kind of this awkwardness about who's going to speak and who's next. So pick some, as a facilitator, pick somebody to speak they share their insight, they share what they did, they share their perspective, and then invite them to ask somebody else um, to then share themselves. And what happens is everyone's paying attention because they, 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 they're they not sure whether they're going to be asked to go next. So it's a super simple technique, which makes sure that people aren't checking their emails um, because there's sort of this light level of anxiety there. And you can have some real fun with things like that. Um, the last thing I'll say is those emotional and personal cues, little things like sharing a high five, really draws people in um, and creates, creates a space that feels more intimate. Um, and you can play with different experiments on that as, as, um, Bill, as Steve mentioned with the photos out the, out the window as well. So just a couple of little insights from what we've been playing with and experimenting. And, and like I say, I think there's going to be so much more in the very near future. Thank you, Carl. So we've got about five minutes left. I'd love to hear what's cooking for you, what, uh, what's landing for you, what insights have you got or questions that uh, can help the group. Uh. This is Trace. I have a really quick one, and I think it was back to the intimacy, which must be top of mind for me uh, today. But I think even the generosity of spirit and your minds together and the examples you're sharing with us, it, it gives that sense of intimacy with the group. Uh, so there's something about what you're doing, like in service even to us that created that. No, thank you, Teresa. Yeah, I think to me, that's that idea of how do we mobilize our, net, our network more consciously. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. You know, just to draft off that a little bit, we were just on a post-certification call for newly minted Leadership Circle Profile Group. And it was done virtually. We had some homework to set them up. There was beautiful dialogue. And one of the things that came up was the grace that is in this model and how our humanity is threaded throughout the whole thing. And this conversation takes me there. It, it, it brings me to a place of grace in the iteration of this new world and how we can show up with one another and experiment and play and laugh at how it gets clunky <laughs> just give ourselves permission to learn and grow together and leaping from that this model just really kind of brings it home and integrates it really fully hmm. so it's striking thanks sandy
I was just reading, um, going back and forth. One of the things that I always love about being on uh, virtual is it takes me back to being a kid in grade school. Um, I'm like, seriously, this is the best ever. So I'm one of those kids in grade school that was the teacher's love and nightmare. I was both. They didn't know quite what to do with it because I had caring connection down at about seven and it was a nightmare. It was a combination. And, uh, one of my favorite things about being in this environment is it takes me back to that eight year old or seven year old that got to pass notes. <laughs> so I just get on chat and pass notes to people I have connected with for a while <laughs> that I care about. And uh, I legitimize that. And I'm like, man, I am eight years again, eight years old again. And I'm flying. I'm like, that is the best ever because I got a little secret connection with someone that I care about. Um, or someone that I want to meet. And it not only is maybe three or four people that I, I don't want to be disruptive. I was, I'm much better at less disruptive now than I was at eight. So I type loud. Someone says, are you typing in the microphone? And I go, yeah, I got busted. But, you know, the virtual connection um, is actually a real way for us to be uh, intimate with one another at scale. And leaders need to learn how to be intimate with one another at scale we have to learn how to be intimate with each other at scale. And I was sitting here a moment ago, um, and Jen, I don't hope you don't mind me sharing this, but uh, Jen, uh, in my note, Jen wrote back, she said, yeah, my husband's Italian. We've been paying really, really, really close attention to what's going on and what that really means and what that looks like. And if anyone's paying attention to what happened first in Northern Italy and now what's happening countrywide, with the country shut down essentially other than pharmacies, banks, and hospitals as of yesterday. Um, this is a human experience we're in. Our business is a human experience. It doesn't just require face-to-face. -face. There's an accelerated learning space going on right now that uh, hasn't been available to us in the way Steve talked about space, maybe for years and years and years. And last thing as we close up here today, um, the human interaction piece for me also is extenuated by, uh, I can look across you all as a group and um, personally say it's my tribe. I told this is the last group we're on with. Uh, these are the people that uh, I believe uh, I wanna be part of and work with, given the work that we're up to and what it means to be radically human and make a difference in the world, or the conscious practice of leadership and uh, being human and uh, united in our inherent unity is absolutely critical. And if it were not as, I don't know a time in our lifetimes that it's any more critical than it is right now. So I just really, really, really appreciate you all weighing in. So, um, and being willing to be with us when we put out the note that we we're going to do this, Doug, I told him it was the most brilliant marketing piece he'd ever put out the shortest ever. Uh, 500 people showed up 500. And this is our last of four. And I'm like, how cool is that? And then all of a sudden others showed up and started lifting. One of my favorite spiritual leaders said, if you want to lead, lift where you stand. Lift where you stand. Carl shows up pretty soon. I got two more colleagues from New Zealand in addition to Carl, including Mark here on uh, Assume that I hadn't met previously uh, in the same way. Uh, lift where you stand, connect with others. And uh, wow, just thanks for, thanks for being willing to join us for an hour today. Really, really, really appreciate it. Perfect opportunity to model the high fives. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome to meet you, Bill. Thank you. Be safe, everybody. Godspeed. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you.